thing. You want to yeah. keep it if you I don't know. Okay. So I've been so <laughs> please continue to get food and get up whenever you need to get food to lunch and learn, not just to learn. So um, I'm yeah. Professor Sarah Budin Benoir. I am Vice President of APC. Can you hear us online? Okay, thank you. Um, we're, this is a lunch and learn of HUC, generously sponsored by uh, HUC LA, thanks to the Dean's office. Thank you, Josh Garraway. And um, it came about because of uh, Nomi Rabia, who's here with us on Zoom. Let's, let's say hi, Nomi, can you just say hi really quick? Uh, sorry, I didn't know my camera's on, hi. <laughs> hi, Nomi. So, hi. Nomi, Oh, yeah. Why don't you just tell us briefly why you had this idea? Um, why I had this idea? Because, you know, we're going back to that more and more that, you know, rabbinical students come from different backgrounds, but this is, we're all Jewish. This is all of our music in a way. So it's important that we represent students of Sephardi Mizrahi background, but also that everybody learns it because it represents all of our cultures. Right. So. Great. Right. So we decided to, we wanted to um, provide some educational content to our students, faculty, and staff across all of our campuses about how to incorporate Sephardi and Mizrahi content into Jewish communal life. So we partnered with the best organization we know that does that, which is Jemena. And so um, today's organization, today's um, event is going to include a presentation by Matthew Nuriel from Jemena and then also a presentation from the Jewish Language Project, which I run, and it happens to be our staff retreat this, this, these days. So we have several of our staff members here. And so as part of the Jewish Language Project presentation, I'll introduce the staff members that are here. Um, so it's gonna be a little lopsided because Matthew's the only representative of Jemena here, but uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna start with Matthew. Oh, cool. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Matthew Nuriel. I'm the Director of Community Engagement for Jemena. Um, if you don't know, Jemena is an acronym for Jews Indigenous to the Middle East and North Africa. If my voice is going and I look exhausted, it's because I was at a Madonna show till 3 o'clock last oh. morning. Last <laughs> night. So bear with me. Um, we actually have a um, Director of Education, but he's based in Seattle, so I I'm kind of filling in for him here today. Um, so I'm just going to give a, a brief overview of some of the educational resources that we offer offer um, <clears throat> at Jimena. Um, and bear in mind that all of these resources are free of charge to any educators or anybody who needs to access them. So to start with, we have Journey to the Mizrah, which can be accessed at journeytothemizrah.org. And what this is, is a curriculum designed for both formal and informal Jewish and non-Jewish educational institutions. It includes 12 lesson plans, which can be utilized by any educator to incorporate Mizrahi and Sephardic history and heritage into their classes. This is geared towards K through 12, but it can easily be adjusted for um, higher education institutions. Um, the Journey to the Mizrah curriculum is part of a more extensive educational re re uh, resource which we have, which is called the Sephardi and Mizrahi Educational Toolkit. And that can be accessed at sephardi-toolkit.org, um, which also includes a resource page that you can find um, a link to the Jewish Language Project, um, as well as the Journey to the Mizrah curriculum. Um, it also includes a page about Israel, which has links to Zionist newspapers uh, translated into, from Hebrew translated into Judeo-Arabic, Ladino, and French. The toolkit also includes a music page featuring one section for Judeo-Arabic music and a section for Ladino music. Um, there's also a Tanakh page, which has link, a link to translations of the Tanakh in Aramaic, Judeo-Arabic, and Ladino. Um, in addition to the Sephardi Toolkit, we have a quarterly journal called Distinction, Distinctions Journal, which I highly recommend everybody check out. You can access that at distinctionsjournal.org. Um, this journal essentially was created to elevate the voices of uh, talents of Sephardi and Mizrahi scholars, uh, researchers, artists, and activists. Each issue tackles a different topic. Our current issue tackles the topic of um, Jewish diaspora, but in our previous two issues, it's a new publication, we just started, it comes out every quarter. So our previous two, one was about anti-Semitism, and the other one was about unity for Israel. 
Um, so that's it for my spiel. I, I don't know if you want need to open it up to questions or uh, sure. Let's do a few questions. Yeah. Sure. So if anybody has any questions about Jemena, feel free to direct them my way. Or if you want to know about the Madonna show. I'm happy to talk about <laughs> yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm curious if you could share a little bit more about Jemena's founding. Um, and and how you all came to be sure so Jimena came to be back in 2001 and what happened was when 9 11 this is my understanding of it i've been with the organization for two years now but from my understanding of it what had happened was after two, um 9 11 there was a lot of um anti-arab or anti-muslim sentiment that was coming up and we the founders who are of north african and middle eastern descent themselves, they were refugees, mostly from North Africa, noticed that the voices and the presence of Mizrahi and Sephardic Jews, that is specifically Jews from the Middle East and North Africa, was completely erased in the conversation. So they started this sort of grassroots movement, if you will, tiny organization with the purpose of educating. So at the end of the day, Jimena, we like I do, I do community engagement. We have all these programs, but at the end of the day, what it comes down to, the main purpose, our main mission is to ensure that the heritage and history of Jews from the Middle East and North Africa is included, not just within Jewish spaces, but also within non-Jewish spaces. So the organization just kind of grew from there, um, and it's been gradually, gradually growing. Um, it was a couple of founders back then, then it grew into the founders plus two employees two years ago. They added two more employees, myself and the director of education. So we're a very small team um, as of now, but we're growing and very happy about that. Mm -hmm. Sure. Did that answer your question? Okay. Other questions about Jimena? I have another question. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I know that there are many people from many different professions in this room. Um, I am a rabbinical student, and so I'm curious if you could say a little bit about like what partnership with Jimena might look like if you're a congregation, other than I know you shared um, this is sort of an overview of many of the educational resources. What could partnering with Jimena look like? I mean, it depends on what capacity you'd want to partner with us. We've done partnerships in terms of programming with many synagogues and educational systems, and uh, um, it can look like anything you need. At the end of the day, any partnership that we take on for any kind of programming has to be geared towards our mission, like it has to be inclusive of our mission. Once that's the baseline, we're good to go. Like we're happy to partner with anyone for anything because again, we want the broader Jewish community and the non-Jewish communities to be aware and understanding of who we are, where we come from, and to ensure that our history and heritage is included. Um, so we do a lot of partnerships with um, I guess Ashkenazi uh, uh, congregations that will bring in one of our speakers from our speakers bureau, which by the way, we have a speakers bureau as well, um, to speak just to educate about who we are in Los Angeles. It's usually based around the Iranian Jewish community, which is the community I come from, just because there's such a large community of us here. But yeah, we do stuff like that all across the country. Yeah, and I can attest that they do say yes when you ask them to partner. Uh, just <laughs> last night, the, the Jewish Language Project had a concert of um, a, a musical duo from Israel singing Yemenite and Persian songs, and we asked Jimena to be a co-sponsor, and they said yes. Yeah, so Slap you. our logo on it, and we're good to go. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't be there last night, and I apologize. Oh, yeah, well, you had more <laughs> different <laughs> concert. I had a different Ms. Rafi <laughs> queen to see it. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so I think we'll turn to the Jewish Language Project. We'll have more time for additional questions later. So the Jewish Language Project is... Oh, no, mm -hmm. that didn't work. Hold on. There we go. Um, people online, I assume you can see that. If you can't, then someone speak up and say something with your voice, because I can't see your chats at the moment. Um, so the Jewish Language Project. Uh, you might even wonder what is 
what are Jewish languages? Well, as you all know, Jewish Jews uh, started out in the land of Israel and went to all different countries in the Middle East, North Africa, Europe, parts of Asia. And in each of those places that they moved to, they encountered a new language. And they picked it up and Judaified it, for the most part. The two most famous Jewish languages, Yiddish and Ladino, are actually exceptions in this history because they were maintained for centuries away from the lands where they originated. And so they're spoken in an area where the people around them speak a completely different language, not a language that's related to it. And here's a little timeline that um, Ariel Stein uh, helped us make with um, all sorts of languages that Jews have spoken throughout history, just to show you that Jews have been creating new languages at every point in, in our history, from the 10th century BCE with ancient Hebrew to Israeli sign language and Jewish Latin American Spanish in the 20th century. However, in the past two centuries, most long-standing Jewish languages have become endangered because primarily because of migrations, but also because of nationalistic language policies and genocide. And so here are some languages that are now considered to be endangered, including Ladino, Judeo-Amazigh, spoken in, in Morocco, Ju uh, Judeo-Alsatian or Alsatian Yiddish, spoken in uh, Alsace-Lorraine region of France, Judeo-Shirazi, spoken in Iran, and uh, Jewish Neo-Aramaic, which we'll hear a little bit more about later, I think, because uh, we have some people here who, who actually have learned this, their ancestral language of Jewish Neo-Aramaic. Can I put it for a second? Yeah. That's my dad's language, by the way. Oh, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't know if you've heard of Nashti Dan. Mm -hmm. My dad is Nashti Dan, so. Amazing, yeah. okay, well. I'm really proud of that. <laughs> so you and Sam have a lot to talk about this. Uh, okay, so now most Jews have very little knowledge of this linguistic diversity. In fact, let me just see a show of hands. Are there any languages on this list that you were not familiar with before? Raise your hand if so. Okay, so if you want to learn more about these languages, you can go to our website, and there are pages about most of these languages, or some of them are subsumed under other languages, but you'll find information about all of these languages. Um, so this is where, where we come in to, to solve that issue of the lack of awareness. Our mission is to promote research on, awareness about, and engagement surrounding the many languages spoken and written by Jews throughout history and around the world. So first of all, why? Why is this our mission? Well, first, for the native speakers of these languages who don't want their linguistic heritage to be lost to history such as Galina Anisimova, who agreed to be recorded by our partner organization, Mother Tongue, in Israel. And she doesn't want her Juhuri language to be lost to history. She's from um, Dagestan, from Derbent, uh, which is a part of Russia. But uh, also, Juhuri is spoken in Azerbaijan, which is a neighboring country to the south. Also for Rachel Gadi, Zichrona uh, Livracha, who was a speaker of Lishan Bidan um, and who um, Sam recorded um, because it happens to be Sam's grandmother. Um, and sadly, she passed away. But to honor her memory and the memory of so many others who have passed away, we want to preserve their languages. But also for the next generation, for people like Sam, to have access to their ancestral languages. Uh, if they didn't get a chance to learn it directly from their grandparent or their great-grandparent, maybe their great-great-grandparent, then we want to have those digital records available so that people can learn those languages in the future. And not just people with ancestry in the community, but also students who want to just learn about a community. A language is a great way to learn about a community. <laughs> Okay, that was not a sign. Uh, a poster just fell down. It's okay. Um, so, and also for Jews around the world, it's a shame that so many Jews don't know about other Jewish communities in other parts of the world. And part of our initiative is to raise awareness about that diversity. So our vision is, this is a, we see this as a 25 year intervention in Jewish communal life. Uh, we started in 2020 and our vision is that by 2045, every known Jewish language will be well-documented, 
Jews will be aware of the linguistic diversity of Jewish communities around the world, and Jews will feel a stronger connection to faraway Jewish communities, past and present. Seems like a, an ambitious vision, right? But we have a great team. I think we can do it. And the question is how? How are we going to do it? So I want to answer that question by starting with our staff, by everyone on our staff that's here right now, just introducing themselves and saying what they've been working on with the Jewish language plan. So let's start with Ariel. Sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hey, I'm Ariel Stein. I'm a fifth year rabbinical student uh, over in New York. It's great to be here. Um, I've been working on a couple of projects uh, for the JLP I started last summer. You saw the timeline, so we won't go into that. And I also worked on creating uh, basically an archive of written manuscripts, tracing Jewish um, written content across space and time that's going to be turned into an interactive map. And then right now I'm working on a toolkit to be used by kind of young adult educational settings to show about Jewish uh, linguistic diversity um, in college settings and a variety of other places. I'm Hannah Pressman. I'm the Director of Education and Engagement. And I run all of our communications and um, online engagement efforts across multiple proliferating social media platforms. Um, and basically, I'm trying to give people of various backgrounds access points to all of the, the many resources that we created. Um, and so that includes our MailChimp newsletters that go out to subscribers. Please sign up if you don't already get our newsletters. Um, and just finding ways to connect people um, with and to raise awareness of our existence and of our mission and to invite people to, to join us in this movement to preserve and celebrate Jewish languages. Um, my own academic background is in modern Hebrew and Yiddish. Um, and during the pandemic, I actually joined the Ladino activist sphere for the first time. Um, and it's been a nice synergy between the activism I've learned from Sarah. Um, and I actually am now the co-director of a new organization called the American Ladino League, which um, is has been founded to support Ladino students and teachers um, in this country because there's currently um, no other infrastructure or organized way to support these students. So if anyone's interested in Ladino specifically, please come talk to me. And um, yeah, thanks for being here. Hi, everybody. I'm Eden Moyal. Uh, you've probably seen me around. I hang out here a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I am the curator and the documentation manager for the Jewish Language Project. I and behind everything that goes on on the website. I put together the language descriptions. Uh, I build all of the exhibits that go up there. So Shabbat, Passover, uh, ritual, liturgy, all of those things I put up there. I also run, like I said, documentation. I have a team, including Alan and Sam, um, who we together do oral histories, interviews with speakers on the major languages. Um, Sometimes we collaborate with the fun, with Hannah you know, on the fun facts, those kinds of things, or with Isabella on TikTok videos. Um, and right now, it's just about collecting as much language from as many speakers of as many languages as possible. I'm Ali Niku. Um, I do a lot of the documentation stuff. Um, so I specifically work on Iranian Jewish languages. So that's both the Persian-based and Called the median based languages of Iran and also the Jewish Neo Aramaic um, dialects that are spoken. Um, so, like, my one of my ancestral languages is Jewish Neo Aramaic, but it's different from Nashtidan, which is yours and yours, uh, <laughs> even though the towns are like down the street from each other. Um, they're totally different, not totally, but they're pretty different dialects. So, uh, I focus on that and the speakers of, of that dialect. And then um, the languages in Iran, because I grew up as a Persian speaker um, and have ancestry all over that country. So it's a lot of documentation, recording people. It's um, looking at old manuscripts that are written in some of these languages and deciphering those and uh, hopefully creating some new um, written examples of these languages uh, by translating things into them. 
I'm Janine Oakman. I'm the assistant director at Jewish Language Project. Um, <clears throat> my background is um, not in languages, but rather in education and in um, museums and arts education. So I've been spearheading a couple initiatives where co-curate or we're curating an exhibit with um, in collaboration with the Anu Museum in Tel Aviv. So I've been helping um, develop that material, that content. We are bringing together a lot of the content that we already have, some of the documentation and the social media stuff into a curriculum for middle grade students, both in supplemental schools and day school settings. And then we're also thinking about how that's transferable to informal education. Um, and then also just helping with a bunch of upcoming special initiatives. Okay, that's okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, I just want to add, I also make videos. I'll add to Janine, she's really cool. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Sam. Uh, I've been working on the Jewish Language Project for a while now, doing uh, documentation for Lishan Dan Jewish New Aramaic uh, from Gormia, where it's where my mother is from. Uh, I got I recorded the oral history of my grandmother, as you heard, which I'm very proud of. Um, there was a video of making harosa with my mother, which should be up soon. And um, it's all oh, it is up. We're great. It if is you up. read the email. Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, it's up. And then uh, so and, you know I'm currently working on. I just hopefully there'll be a song going up that I tra transcribed and translated, and hopefully more content coming soon. Hi, I'm Isabel. Um, I'm the TikTok team captain. So if you follow our TikTok, you've probably seen me. Um, but I make videos. I control, you know, the schedule. And right now, what we're doing is we're working on collaborations. So we're trying to bring in people who have like followings and who post about um, Judaism or they post about linguistics and they kind of merge our content together. So at the moment, we're working on something with Cameron Bernstein um, to have her do some Yiddish content with us, which I'm super excited for. Um, and as Ariel said, you know, she has an interactive map that's coming soon. So I'm the one who works on interactive maps. Um, I have an endangered language project. So I was taking videos and audio recording um, across a 70 year time span and putting it on a map so you can see kind of the places where they were spoken and kind of when these recordings were made. So some are as early as like the 50s, which is really fun. And then circling back over here, hello, I'm Lizzie Frankel. I actually know most people here and some on the screen um, because I'm a third year student at HUC and I am joining this summer the Jewish Language Project to help launch a program connecting speakers of endangered Jewish languages with people who want to learn, possibly people in their own families, TBD. Um, and we're also gonna have a language advocacy component for people who want to just be advocates as well. Great team, right? Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. Just show you a little bit more about the, the things that we've been talking about. So when we were talking about language, endangered languages, you can't just record them. You have to, this has to be done in collaboration with other stages, like making those recordings accessible to the world, raising awareness about the languages. When we first started documenting Iranian Jewish languages, a lot of Iranian Jews themselves didn't know what we were talking about. And they didn't really realize that the way that their grandparents spoke was different than the way that they speak and that that would be of interest. Those who did speak, who do speak those languages, some of them felt that those languages were stigmatized and they didn't want to record them. But I think our work to raise awareness and to um, make the languages to, to, to recognize the importance of these languages has been working because I think now more and more people are interested in recording their languages. Um, and education, um, not just raising awareness about the languages, but actually teaching the languages. And so we do this work in conjunction with our partner organizations in the Jewish Language Consortium, which we convened. Uh, so for example, the Oxford School of Rare Jewish Languages has classes, free classes online. Sometimes the time zones are tough with California, but um, you can take classes in something like 18 different Jewish languages to, to actually learn the languages. And um, our, our partner organizations, Mother Tongue, Endangered Language Alliance, and Wikitongues do documentation of endangered languages more generally. And we've been working with them to focus on Jewish languages in particular. And we make dictionaries with our partner organization, Living Tongues. Uh, for example, um, there is a Jewish Neo-Aramaic dictionary that we've been working on that has recordings of each entry. So just to give you a sense of the importance of 
these languages. I'm going to play a little video that Alan made, uh, just uh, very sweet interactions. <laughs> She said it's so fast. Hey, that's so much. Hi. 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 الهام هلتي يعني ان شاء الله مخان برمضان بيجيرم مخان الهام هلتي سي بختقور هاي بختقور لك برو لا لك بيت بختقوري هنا الهام هلتي الهام هلتي اه 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 فاري الهام هلتي My name is Elon Azizi. And I am Adi Kadusi. And our families came to Israel from San Andaj. And from Bijar, which is in Western Iran. Shalom. Esme man haideya aynechiyu. Man Tehran mutabalad babiyan. Veli familia matahle hamida buendan. My name is Galit Dardashti, and I'm an anthropologist and vocalist. I grew up in the United States speaking English, but my father grew up speaking Persian in Tehran, and he remembers my grandparents speaking only small phrases of Judeo Isfahani and Judea Hamadani. The mass immigration of Iranians, Iranian Jews from Iran, left us with a hole in our hearts. It's so important to record these languages while we still can, because for one, they allow those of us who feel disconnected from our Persian Jewish heritages a way in. So what I heard about Vicky tongues and preservation of old languages, I left a message. I said, that's me. I can really help. And now I'm interviewing people with a passion. I'm interviewing people with the Judeo Hamadani, Judeo Kashani, Judeo Esfahani. And when now I hear Hamadani, it takes me back to my, the bosom of my beloved grandmother and all the values that she still in our family. But this is a race for time. We are working on new. So much more to, to talk about, but I want to uh, move on to the next. Uh, I always have trouble with that. Um, okay. um, so also we do online events, and this is something that you can use in your communities, your schools, your synagogues, etc. We have a video library of dozens of events that we've done, uh, ranging topics ranging from theater, to women's voices, to liturgy, to Iranian Jewish languages, to queer Jewish languages. And so all of these videos can be used in, in educational settings. And we also have some in-person events. We have one coming up in New York. So those of you on the New York campus, we'd love to see you on our Jewish Silk Road Tour of Queens, where we're going to be visiting Bukharian, Persian, and Georgian synagogues, restaurants, museums, et cetera, and learning from uh, cultural leaders and language activists and scholars there. Um, so you, you heard about some of the online resources, but I wanted to show you. So here's that map that um, Isabel was talking about, where there's a dot for each recording in our partner's collections. And so you can click on the dots and then hear the recordings. It's a really fun way to engage with our collection. Our website has descriptions of 32 languages and resources about each of them. We also have all sorts of online exhibits, including surrounding holidays. So if you're interested in some Passover material, uh, we have a, a whole exhibit. And you can take one of these Haggadah supplements, which has uh, information about 
each of the languages there. And those of you online can find that Haggadah supplement at jewishlanguages.org in our Passover exhibit. There's also a Zoom Haggadah, a uh, PowerPoint Zoom Haggadah that includes a lot of these resources. And we have recordings of Chad Gad Yah, Echad Mi Odea, and so many other Passover songs from around the world, and uh, Haroset recipes. And if that thing, that one of the posters that hasn't yet fallen down <laughs> is the Haroset map, where you can see how Jewish languages <laughs> around the world call Haroset or Lachlik or Halech, many different names for it. We also have an, a multilingual Omer counter. Um, that poster is up there as well, and you can find that on our exhibit. You can use this in your communities to count the Omer every day in a different language. <laughs> we also have crowdsourced dictionaries, and this is another way that you can get involved. If you're a native speaker of English, you can contribute words to our Jewish English lexicon, or if you're a native speaker of Swedish, German, French, Russian, Brazilian, Portuguese, and uh, Latin American Spanish, any of those languages, then you can contribute by adding words in those languages. It's essentially words that are used by Jews from Hebrew, from Judeo-Arabic, from Yiddish, from Ladino, in, that are used in contemporary languages. Um, so, and here's an example of an entry page. You get the entry and you can click on it and hear how it's said. Sometimes there's multiple pronunciations and then definitions and who uses it, which is a unique feature that dictionaries don't normally have. So uh, Hannah mentioned the social media engagement. A lot of our, our posts are around holidays. Uh, and so these are great ways to engage your communities. You could send out a post um, shortly before a holiday about something interesting linguistically related to that holiday. Um, the TikTok channel is really fun. There's a lot of interesting educational content, but also some fun engagement. Um, so, and Janine mentioned that curriculum that she's working on. We are looking for more schools to pilot this curriculum. It's a modular curriculum, so you can pick and choose lesson plans from it. And you, the students learn about migration patterns, as well as uh, Jewish languages and names. And then they do a project to interview a relative and write about or demonstrate how they fit into the Jewish mosaic. Alan mentioned those short films. We have one on Jewish Neo-Aramaic and one on Iranian Jewish languages that are intended for educational use. And you can see a lot of merchandise on our little merch table over here. All of this is for sale in our red bubble shop. Um, and we can um, also uh, you, um, you know, give you a discount if you want to buy it here. Just talk to any member of our team. Um, and so some of this is, is useful for educational settings, like our posters and our stickers. Also, for those of you attending in person, we want to give you each a sticker. So feel free to take one of those on your way out. Um, and so, and I'll be in New York next week, so I'll bring some stickers along. So if there's anyone on the New York campus, I can give those to you then. And for those in Cincinnati, I'm sorry, I don't have any plans to be in Cincinnati. Um, but next time I do, I'll bring some stickers. So, and we also do free consultation. So we get calls and emails all the time from journalists, filmmakers, authors, educators, organizations, and just anyone who visits our website with questions or requests for certain information. For example, any, any fans of the Golden State Warriors here? <laughs> yeah, okay, well, um, the Golden State Warriors contacted us through a uh, local Jewish newspaper, J Weekly, and asked us, they wanted to do a Jewish Heritage Day shirt, but they didn't want to just include Hebrew, they wanted lots of languages. So we gave them the phrase Golden State Warriors in many languages. They didn't end up using it on the shirt, no. but um, but we uh, we created this image and you can find that on our website. They We tried to include it on our Redbubble shop, but we got dinged for copyright because no. of the logo. So we fixed it and now there's just like a basketball there and it doesn't actually say Golden State Warriors <laughs> in English. <laughs> but, but you can still find it. And uh, yeah. So also some things that we're working on. We're working on a Jewish baby name search tool. This is something we get requests from rabbis a lot for resources about Jewish names. There are some websites out there that have useful information, but they have flaws, there are things missing, and 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 we have data from a survey that I did in 2019 
on this. And by the way, I'm teaching a class next year online <laughs> called Jewish Names and Naming, an elective. So if you're if you're able to take electives next year, like, you're going to take it. Okay. Yeah. Wait, um, like, like for rabbinical? For, for rabbinic, yeah. Take it with me. Yeah. Um, anyway, so um, working on that Jewish baby name website, you heard about the exhibit we're working on. We would love for you to exhibit that in any institution you're involved in. It's a capsule exhibit, meaning you can download the posters, print them out. There are how many panels? 25, 27, Janine, something like that? Uh, 20, 27, 29. Okay, and you can also pick and choose which which panels you want to include about Jewish languages around the world. Um, and you heard from Lizzie about this heirloom initiative. We would love for you to get involved as a language learner or a language advocate. And for those of you who happen to speak an endangered Jewish language as a mentor. So in addition, we would love to get your help finding financial support because all of this work takes money to, to power. Um, we would love for you to join our email list and follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Threads, and LinkedIn. Um, also to subscribe to us on YouTube. We post videos there, shorts, um, maybe about once a week. And then we also have uh, a lot of content there that you can that you can watch um, and spread the word about Jewish diversity, Sephardi and Mizrahi Jews, Jews around the world, and uh, using the lens of language and also other cultural domains like food, music, etc. Um, also, we are looking for some more schools to pilot that curriculum. So if you're interested in that, let us know and feel free to um, to uh, engage with our merchandise because. Engaging with Jewish languages also happens offline. <laughs> and that's it. Now we'd love for your questions. Thank you. Yes. Um, I, I have an academic kind of question. Can you explain in layman's terms, from a linguistic perspective, what, at what point does a language become a Judeo language? So that, for example, Swedish, when does it become Judeo-Swedish? Uh, when does Ladino not, when is it not Spanish anymore? Is it a matter of vocabulary, syntax, orthography, all of those? Is there some taxonomy that we can understand quickly? Yeah. It's a great question. So one way of doing this is mutual intelligibility. Like you can say, if two people speak different differently, but they can still understand each other, then they're really just speaking dialects of the same language. If they can't, then they're different languages. So that's that's a criterion that linguists use to distinguish between dialects and languages. However, that's problematic because sometimes people who speak one way can understand people who speak another way, but not vice versa, right? And there's a power dynamic there. Um, also, political... <coughs> Factors play a role in, in what's considered a separate language. Like Swedish and Danish are considered to be separate languages because they're spoken in different countries, but they're mutually intelligible, right? And the way that some Orthodox Jews speak English is so different from how we speak English that it is not, they're not mutually intelligible. You need subtitles. And even with the subtitles, you can't always understand it, right? Um, and so so would you say that Orthodox Jewish English is a different language than Jewish English? In popular parlance, it's not usually considered such. So the, there are many factors in how these work, but the way that I like to think about it is it doesn't matter if it's a different language or a dialect or just uh, a few words used within, within a language. I just think of it as a continuum of Jewish linguistic distinctiveness. So Jewish Swedish is more similar to Swedish than Ladino is to Spanish. And Ladino is more similar to Spanish than Yiddish is to German, right? And, and so that, that I think is a useful way of doing it. And you can also use that to analyze any given utterance. Like, oh, the way that that person just said that is more similar to standard whatever than, than the way that that person said it. Um, and then you can think about how that relates to extra linguistic factors, like how Jews who have more textual um, background tend to use more Hebrew and Aramaic words than those who have less. So does that answer your question? That's very helpful. Okay. Thank you. Can I add something to that? 
you also see if you go like language by language, especially if you play around in the language descriptions on the website, um, each language kind of grows its own distinctive marker from the non-Jewish variety. They'll develop a particular syntax or a particular um, uh, phonological phenomenon that's not present. Some some shift that has gone gone on either like a sound that used to be present because it belongs to the uh, non-Jewish variety and it's gone now, or the other way around. Um, and you know there are a lot of other like. Uh, adoptions of Hebrew uh, phonemes, sounds, um, but but each one will do also its own thing, such that they don't all satisfy X, Y, and Z criteria, but each one is a little bit different from the one that it's supposed to be. You know? yeah. That's exactly right. And so some linguists would say, if there are not structural distinctive features, then it's really just the same language, same dialect, it just has different words. But then you get sentences like this, Chanichim and Madrichim go to the Teatron for Pe'ulat Erev. Yeah. Right? That's, that's, that's Camp Hebraized English, right? Uh, and not just Ramah, also some, a lot of other camps, right? Southern camps. Yeah, URJ camps, right? So, so, um, so that, is that, is that mutually intelligible? No. If you didn't go to do summer camp, you wouldn't know what that sentence means, right? And so, so my take on the lexical structural issue is, I think lexicon is pretty important, and also structural features are, are important. And, and in, not just, so in addition to the syntactic features, the grammar and the phonological features, the pronunciations, sometimes there are other features like gestures or Length or speed of speech. Do Jews talk faster? Do Jews talk louder? Do, do, do Jews interrupt more? We don't interrupt, we overlap. <laughs> okay. so, that, so that's a discourse feature. That's a feature of discourse that is part of language, but is not the grammar or the, the words that we use. Also intonation. Sometimes Jews speak in a distinctive way, and you then right? so, so that that chanting intonation contour is part of Jewish linguistic repertoires. Yeah. I can also yeah. add that there, there's sometimes these terms like the Judeo something term is used differently by different people or by academics versus the people who speak the language. So in the example of Judeo Persian, that's academically used to mean. Persian that's written in Hebrew letters right. and like standard Persian that's written in Hebrew letters. But the people who are writing that didn't necessarily speak that way. And so also when we talk about Jewish Persian or Judeo-Persian today, that's also like sometimes that's a dialect that's spoken that's quite different from a written variety. Um, and then like there are languages that have diglossia anyway, where the written and the spoken variety are super different anywhere, the formal and the colloquial. Uh, so I think those terms can also be used differently. And if you asked a speaker of any Judeo-Persian language if they speak Judeo-Persian, they would be like, no, what are you talking about? I speak normal Persian. So I, a lot of it is also this like cognitive part of it. Yeah, I just read an article about Iraqi Judeo-Arabic and whether it's a different language than just Iraqi Arab Arabic. And there's debate, you know, scholars debate it and speakers debate it. But it's also interesting how the scholarly discourse influences the public discourse about it. If people, if there's a name for your way of speaking, then sometimes that's going to have maybe a more positive impact on, on your understanding of yourself. Oh, I speak uh, that language. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, e even if it's mutually intelligible with what's around you, or it could have the opposite effect. Like, I don't speak differently. I just speak this language. Why do I need a name for my similar way of speaking, you know? I have a question. Yeah. How is the conversation about Jewish languages um, similar or different to conversations about Jewish food? Mm. Right, like, that's my question. team. Convert, like so much, like so much of what I hear about conversation about Jewish food is that there is no uniquely Jewish food, that all of our foods from all over the world are influenced by the cultures in which we live. Um, and so there is no actual quote unquote Jewish food, like that's a conversation. So how is the conversation about Jewish language similar to or different like, than that? As a non-linguist, I have a thought. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I think the question of uniqueness to me doesn't seem actually particularly meaningful. I think that's a rabbit hole that's a way of kind of sidelining more interesting content, which is like what versions of these things are distinctly Jewish and express the richness of Jewish diversity and culture. Mm -hmm. um, I think the hunt for uniqueness, like in the creative world in general, um, to me as an artist feels like a moot point. But that that's my hot take. <laughs> <laughs> I will say like from, from personal experience that I, you know, there are a lot of Jewish foods out there that are really not very well documented right. and are probably more, more leaning towards foods that are not similar to what non, non Jews eat. And then when you have a food that has a different name, it's prepared differently. I mean, you can argue that there's influence, but like, there's like, like, I don't know. I feel, I feel like it's hard. It depends on how you think about it. And it depends on the food. When you think about the the language discussion, you know I'm coming from perspective of Jewish New Aramaic, which is one of the most distinct uh, languages. It's not in it's not mutually intelligible with any non-Jewish language, as far as I'm aware. And we have foods that are similar. Um, I was just asking Alan about Gundi because I know there's a Persian Jewish food that that I'm pretty sure not like non-Jews don't make anything like it. Um, it's a uh, yeah, it's it's uh, they was made for Shabbat and. Um, and I, you know, I know I grew up with a bunch of foods with 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 these obscure names, and I've I've never seen it anywhere outside of my house. Not on the internet, you can't find it. Not on the, you know, and not yet. Not yet. <laughs> not yet. Not yet on the internet. Um, and so I think a lot of the discourse around this is suffering from limited like limited data. Like they're you know they're just a lot of foods just aren't documented. I actually think big picture, it's a, a useful analogy um, because if you think about um, uh, every language kind of being distinct from and similar to its host, every Jewish language, its host culture, yeah. we can make that argument about food. Like what, what do I eat as a Jew living in Northern California? I eat food some that my ancestors probably brought from their communities in Europe that were influenced by those, but I also eat Mexican food and I eat fresh seafood and I, you know what, all of those things. So I think it's, I mean, like just in like a sort of a, a more sort of big picture blanket way, I think it's, it's interesting to think about it like that and it helps a lay person understand how these languages arose and what makes them both distinct and similar. Yeah, in fact, I would say there are multiple sources of influence that you can talk about parallels in language and food. There is the textual tradition. So with food, you have kashrut, you have holidays, you have, um, so things that come from our texts that lead to, and life cycle events, that lead to us eating distinctive foods, whether it's round foods for a funeral or, um, or um, symbolic foods for Rosh Hashanah, right? Um, or so, so, and then kashrut that, you know, various rules relating to kashrut, those come from the text, just as in our Jewish languages, we have words from the text, Hebrew and Aramaic words from the text. Another source of influence is the previous place that Jews lived or previous places that Jews lived, right? So in, in Jewish English, we have, in addition to words from Hebrew and Aramaic, textual Hebrew and Aramaic, we also have words from Yiddish and from Ladino in Sephardic communities and from Judeo-Arabic in Jews from Arabic speaking countries. So, so those are pre-migration languages that influence just as with foods, like Janine said, you might eat Gefilte fish if you're Ashkenazi, you might eat borekas if you're Sephardi, you might eat Gandhi if you're Persian, right? Um, did I say that right? Gandhi? Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and then, but then there's another influence, which is Israel, right? Israel plays a huge role in contemporary Jewish uh, culture. So American Jews use a lot of words from modern Hebrew. So like the sentence I said before from Camp Hebraized English has Hebrew words that are really influenced by modern Hebrew. Um, and then food, I mean, we have this Middle Eastern food, um, and but you know, like thinking about foods as Israeli, like even just saying, what are you bringing to the Shabbat dinner? Can you bring a salad? Can you bring some salatim? What does that mean? You just said salad and salad. No, you said salad and hummus and you know turkey <laughs> salad or whatever. So, so these are like this is Jewish English, right? Um, and so, but then there's also some distinctive features that don't come from any of those sources. And like for example, um, the um, saying uh, right instead of right. 
is common in Orthodox Jewish English, like that t at the end of the word. Um, that isn't from the text. That isn't from uh, Yiddish. It's just another feature that develops in a community that has some degree of insularity. And same with the foods. There might be some distinctive thing that develops in a food, like, for example, eating Chinese food on Arab Christmas. That is a distinctive <laughs> thing that, that isn't influenced by Yiddish. It isn't influenced by our text. Well, maybe a little bit by our text in that we don't celebrate Christmas, but isn't influenced by Israel. But it's just something that developed in American, American society. I had a question for the documentarians. Um, obviously, you're trying to capture the language and you want to just hear them speak, but there were some sort of exchanges going on that were personal. Do you have a script that you sort of have out laid so you, you get them to say the most words or does it just kind of flow in conversation? Um, yeah, it's a mix of those. We, we do have like a elicitation kind of protocol, like the types of questions you should be asking, you know, the, like a problem with it is that often in the past people would do in, interviews and all their questions were about childhood. And so then you'd only learn the past tense of a language. Mm -hmm. And suddenly it's like, well, we have no examples of present, future, so that, it, so that we you work on expanding the, the protocol. So you're asking about like, what are you doing tomorrow? Or what do you like to do every day? Or things like that. Um, so the, you know, there are scripts for how to get the most linguistic information or data out of the thing. But a lot of it is also just like reading the person you're talking to knowing what they want to talk about. They always have something they actually want to talk about. Um, seeing if this person is going to be willing to tell you the curse words that most people won't tell you, you know, or will they sing a song or will they tell a joke or um, it's, it's a conversation, you know, and it's, it's helpful to be able to speak their language or know their culture or have some kind of in, be friends with their grandchild, whatever it is. Um, to, to get it going. So uh, often it's like, you're not going to get anything good in the first 45 minutes, but the last 10 minutes, you really, that's when the good stuff happens. Sometimes you turn off the camera and that's when the good stuff happens. That's when they tell you the curse words. That's, yeah. when, they, <laughs> that's when they like pull you over and they're like, okay, but let me, you know. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a mix of those. Yeah. Um, to, to add to that about uh, with the scripts, I think in my experience, Having a script is more of a necessity. Like we, like I think I personally would love to go to a speaker and, and be like, "Here's a, here's a video. This is going to be your like. This is a legacy for you. <clears throat> Tell the world whatever you want." And the thing is, is that people don't know what to do with that. Like they, they really just don't. You, you know, they need you need to give people a little structure. And I I try you know with, you know with my grandmother I tried to keep it as like like uns unscripted as possible, you know, you ask one question and then, you know, you just got to get them going and then they'll start talking. But the, you know, there, there's a few techniques that, that I worked on. One thing that I was very big on pushing was incorporating uh, informed consent in the actual video, uh, like asking, like, are you okay with posting this on the internet? Are you okay with us recording in the language and having that response as part of the beginning of the video? not only to boost content, but also like, you know, to, to get a wider variety of, of, of content and then also have the consent there. But, um, you know, there, there are ways you can work around to try to get more diverse content and like poke, poke at it. Um, and it's definitely like, it's something always evolving, like thing. It also, it also helps sometimes if you get two or three speakers which are usually going to be siblings because so few people speak some of these languages, yeah. but you get a couple of people who know each other, get them to sit, and then suddenly the work gets done for you because mm -hmm. they just will start talking to each other. And suddenly you have to interrupt them and ask, like, wait, what does that mean? What does that mean? What, you know? So that it's um, part of it is just, is just the human thing of tricking people into right. talking. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, Matthew, I'm wondering what you think after hearing all this stuff about language, about possible partnerships with Jimena, or just anything else that you want people to know about Jimena. Um, yeah, well, you guys, I, I love hearing about the work that you're doing in terms of recording history, because we also have oral history project that we, it's an ongoing project that's been going on for about 10 years. Um, and just hearing the similarities of what you do, as um, obviously their focus is language, ours is 
to get the stories of the like for example uh, we have Joe Samuels he's like 94 years old he was a survivor of the Farhud so he's we just want to get all those stories while we can because those generations that lived through the, those events are dying sorry to say so um yeah so definitely check that out and um yeah just what you guys do is incredible so. you too yeah. thanks <laughs> yeah. yeah okay well thanks so much for coming everybody yeah. okay <laughs>